Uh, I'm Nathan Buckner. I'm an SDT at Rackspace. Uh, I work with the quality engineering uh, tools team, designing tools for security uh, and for other QE testing teams. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. That way I can uh, so um, I'm Stephen Lowry. I'm also a software developer test at Rackspace. Uh, I work on the automation and infrastructure team. Uh, we work on pretty much everything uh, throughout the company, developing tools, uh, helping de uh, design and uh, scope out solutions for different problems. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try to talk loud here. So I'm Matt Valdez, um, the security developer uh, of the group. So, um, so what does that mean? So uh, our team on the security side, we actually report in the same structure as the, the quality engineering team. Um, so that means we're responsible for a lot of the testing efforts for our products, uh, external, internal, uh, infrastructure, web APIs, obviously, uh, web UIs, uh, code reviews, um, so pretty much the whole gamut there. We have a separate compliance department that handles those types of things, luckily. Um, we're involved a, li a little bit in the testing there sometimes. But um, so when we're talking about, uh, you know, our program and the way that we, we manage things uh, and the, way the testing that we do, there's so much to do. Um, so, you know, in case, in case you, uh, you know, have been living under a rock, or didn't see Matt Tesoro's talk yesterday. Um, there's, this, there's this move towards doing a, kind of an AppSec pipeline, right? Doing automation where you can, um, managing vulnerabilities, managing your intake, managing your processes. So, so as we look at kind of a pipeline structure, um, it's kind of a theoretical thing when we talk about a pipeline. But um, we really want to kind of look at what, what's inside that pipeline, what needs to be done. Um, so picturing a pipeline, you've got inputs to it. Something happens in the pipeline, um, magic, some, some beard rubbing, stuff like that. And on, the, on the end of that pipe, what do you get? Well, hopefully you get secure applications, secure software, things like that. Um, so looking deeper in that magic, um, oh yeah, security pipeline. Um, looking deeper in the magic, the thing that, that obviously we're focused on here uh, in the security group is testing. So that's, to us, that's probably the most fun thing to do. It's also arguably uh, the most time intensive thing to do. Um, and so I think that's really where we can kind of try to get the biggest bang for your buck when you're talking about automation and, and reviewing your processes. Um, so obviously there's always gonna be manual testing, um, manual verification of bugs, um, you don't want false positives in your reports to the developers. So there's always going to be some manual steps, but let's see what we can do to automate. So what do we have? We have a lot of great tools uh, where we can do that. Um, you guys might recognize some of these. I don't know. Um, we kind of put this slide together. This is definitely not a definitive list. Um, not sure that we use all these things, or I know that we don't use all these things. Um, I just kind of wanted to put a good kind of cross section of all the different tools that are available. So obviously, Top row, first class citizens are open source tools that we know and love. Um, and of course, there are third party vendors. And, and obviously, there's outsourcing that you can do as well for some of this testing. Um, so again, what are we responsible for? Infrastructure. Um, is there any, anybody else uh, responsible for infrastructure testing where you're at? This guy back here? Yeah. Um, so tools for that. Recognize anything here in map? Classic, um, the alien guy, Nikto, he's good, good stuff. Um, so then we talk about from infrastructure, we look at uh, code reviewing, code analysis. Um, we've used Ver Verico in the past. Um, there's probably some other tools up here you, you could use, check marks. Um, and then going on to web UIs. So we have a lot of crawlers, things that, that'll work with that. Um, and, and so automation for, for those three are great. So when we come to APIs, um, we found that there's a lot of gaps there. Um, so some of these, some of these uh, tools kind of cross over into API testing. Um, obviously we use, we use Port Swigger's Burp Suite uh, quite a bit for that stuff and it's a wonderful tool. It's really enabling uh, for us 
to be able to see the packets, be able to manipu manipulate the packets. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great. But the, the, so I think there's still some work to be done there, obviously, uh, with automation. And I actually being able to do automation within, like, your Jenkins pipeline or being able to do automated testing uh, to, again, get that, that efficiency. So today, API testing automation. So right now, I feel like I'm just going to keep doing the same things that, we keep, that we've been doing, um, using curl, writing custom code. Um, some, of, uh, some of our team is actually using some of our, our QE test frameworks to write security tests. Um, very development heavy. Um, not exactly reusable between different, uh, different products, different APIs. Um, very custom. It works great, but it's very time intensive. Um, so why does that matter to us? So, it's not, so for us, it's not good enough to say, okay, we've got automation for infrastructure. We've got automation for UIs. We've got automation for some code, static analysis. Um, maybe we just leave API testing as kind of a gap in automation. We just keep, it, keep doing that manually or, or partially automated. Um, well, at Rackspace, we use OpenStack for a lot of our products. Um, in case you don't know, it's an open, open source cloud platform. Uh, it was actually started by NASA and Rackspace in 2010. Um, lots of code has been contributed, as you can see, and there's a lot of contributors to the project. Most of it's Python. So again, uh, going back to the static analysis piece, there's, a, there's, there's more, uh, more platforms that are supporting Python as we go along, but it's definitely been a gap here. Um, I'll talk about a, a a, a Python static analysis tool a little bit later. But uh, this, the, the reason this is relevant for APIs is because OpenStack is basically API-centric. Um, for Rackspace, if you go to our website and you want to sign up for a cloud service, pick one, pick them all. Um, there's a ton of them, so I think there's 20 up here. Um, each one has an API, each one has multiple resources, uh, potentially multiple versions. Uh, it runs the whole gamut. So we're responsible for testing these things. Um, and these are all public facing. These all offer public APIs. Um, customers are using these. So they're, they're pretty high value assets. Um, there's a lot of exposure up there. Um, to add to that, we do have a control panel for customers to use to kind of take advantage of some of the, uh, some of the more popular features here. But a lot of the functionality behind the API is not exposed in that UI. So that's where some of the, some of the uh, automated API testers that we have, API testers, if you want to call them that, today kind of have a gap because they're browser driven. They need a, they need a UI to find the links, to find the resources, to crawl those pages and, get, and, and examine the, the, uh, the traffic going back and forth and, and manipulating that data. Um, so if we don't have a UI exposing these capabilities, we have to test it, uh, you know, straight on to the API. Um, so, in addition to these public APIs, obviously we're going to have a bunch of internal, uh, probably twice as many or more uh, internal. There's admin functions that obviously aren't going to be exposed in the UI. Um, and so, there's a there's a pretty large gap here for us as far as automation is concerned. Oh, I'll wait on that. So. So that's why, uh, that's kind of the, the case for us to kind of work towards a, a more automated solution, right? So um, in addition to that, so APIs, so they can be easy to test. Sometimes the JSON just looks like this. Sometimes it looks like this. Um, you know, there's all sorts of information here, all sorts of different data types. Um, this is just one resource for one of the APIs that has multiple resources and APIs all over the place. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, so what does that mean? So what do we do? Um, so we work together, partnered with the QE team, because these guys are writing lots of code. They're, they're uh, using our using a Open Cafe framework, which we'll talk about. Um, and they partnered with us to kind of build a tool to help uh, add some automation to these API tests. Now, again, we're using their frameworks to write security tests. That's a lot of overhead. So we wanted to go ahead and, and try to make something that's a little bit more flexible a little bit easier for security guys to use because we're not all hardcore developers. 
Um, and we all don't have time to always be writing code. So we want something that's a, that uh, basically can be automated. It's a fuzzer for HTTP requests. Um, right now, it's, we're using FuzzDB, typical test strings. But like I said, it's fully customizable. You can add additional files if you want. You can write, um, you know, use different uh, frameworks for those test strings or write your own. And uh, even better, it's open source. So um, we have done that work to kind of make it available to anyone to use. So in, in comes Centribos. Uh, so Centribos is our in-house security framework uh, that's built actually on top of Open Cafe, which is our in-house QE framework. So uh, having that, that synergy with the QE team is really what gives it power. So when we, when we test APIs and we start doing our fuzzing and we hit, oh, we found this vulnerability, you can inject uh, SQL into this key value in this huge dictionary uh, request. And then we, you know, we normally, old process, we would throw it over the wall and be like, okay, uh, or they'd throw it over the wall and be like, okay, QE guy, write a test that tests this super crazy SQL thing that the QE has no idea why it's breaking and why it's injecting. Uh, well, some of the QA has no idea. A lot of the QA has no idea. Some of them know. But uh, anyway, so having the, working in the same framework uh, allows us to say, this is exactly what we tested. This is, we can actually print the unit tests. We can create the unit tests and put them directly into their regression uh, because we're sharing the same framework, if that makes sense. Same classes, same architecture. Um, so. Oh, let me talk about Open Cafe a little more. Open Cafe uh, is based on unit tests. Uh, those are the links if you'd like to check them out. Uh, the read the docs and the GitHub. And yeah, I suggest I, I'd like everyone to check it out. So how Centrobos is architected. Uh, so we read from a configuration uh, and the configuration is usable at any point during the request pipeline. So we have a request, which is your standard burp request. Uh, you know, just copy that payload. Uh, we pass that into our data generator, which will go and fuzz the individual keys in the JSON or the XML. Uh, and it's extensible, so you can add YAML later or whatever you're looking for. And then that goes to the data generated test, which is just sending, actually making the request, and then validation, checking status codes, checking length, checking for a, a huge SQL dump, uh, stuff like that. So let's go into our configuration, how, how a, a Centribos configuration would look. Um, so basically you, you decide your endpoint. Uh, that's gonna set your network layer. Uh, and then uh, the other configs, the username, the auth, all of that, all the rest is uh, customizable depending on the test. So if your test requires a user, then you need to put that in your config. If, uh, if your test requires some other endpoint or some other configuration data, you can just, it's, it's extensible. You can create the config and have it, uh, and have it read in anywhere during the test. So uh, this is an example of a standard, I put Centribus request, but actually it's just standard burp request. Pretty straightforward copy paste example. Uh, just copy it out, paste it into a, a file. Um, so what's what's cool about our payload generation? Uh, so if you're doing SQL injection, it's dropping SQL uh, in, injects into all the variables. If you're doing LDAP injection, it's doing some very specific LDAP queries. Um, oh, as I said earlier, network layers covered by the config. Uh, and this is really only for HTTP currently. We plan on adding other protocols in the future. Uh, you know, like having like an active MQ would, would be nice, so you can fuzz into your Q system. Uh, but currently, it only supports HTTP. Um, these are the different things that we can fuzz. We can fuzz the path, the parameters, the headers, and the body, JSON, XML. Um, the validation is defined by the individual test, and it's extensible. So if you make a base fuzz validation, which we do have, um, and we have a SQL inject test that extends it, we can override the validation and check for the specifics. 
Um, extensions. So uh, one of the problems with trying to to get to fit security testing into a, a framework that's designed for QE is there's always code limitations that that we have to overcome. Like uh, oh, it's only designed to send uh, the correct body. It's not designed to send invalid JSON, or it's not designed to, to send invalid XML. And that, that's a problem for security testers. If you can't use a framework uh, and send invalid data, you know, it's, it's not very useful. So that's, that's one of the, the benefits of Centrobos. It can literally replace anything in the request. Uh, in fact, uh, did anyone do the capture the flag? No one? No one did capture the flag today, yesterday? Okay, uh, there was the first step of that. We could have, we could actually use. Uh, it was it had to do with the headers. We could have actually used Centrobos to find that first SQL inject. Uh, if anyone else. Spoiler yeah. alert. Spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure everyone knows by now, right? Uh, anyway, uh, we we could have actually uh, fuzzed the headers with Centrobos, and it would have it would have brought to light that SQL inject. Um, it's not really an API, but in, in reality, uh, an API and a web page are, they're very similar. It's just data coming back in a body. And in that specific example, uh, we would be fuzzing the headers. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really make a difference what, you know, what we're sending in the body. We would just copy the request from Burp, run the fuzz headers test with SQL injects, and then magic. Okay. So, uh, Let's see. Uh, we also add, so our extensions allow us to do stuff like get the authentication token. Uh, it allows us to make our, uh, our request custom. So uh, we'll, we'll go into this a little more during the demo. Oh, which is right now. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is our demo. No, no, and this slide is very appropriate. This, upon starting the thing, I run Linux on my Mac, uh, and this video adapter does not work on it. So let's get it. Okay. So we have Burp. Okay. So uh, let's open these files so it's not just me running one command. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Weezer plus. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So this is me running Centrobos. This is the config file. Oops. Okay. This is the config file I'm using, and this is the payloads, uh, or the payload yeah. that I. The HTTP request. So before I run this. Going yes, of course. Uh, let's see where where does your virtual environment live? <laughs> uh, so let's see. Good question. Sorry. So uh, this is just something about Open Cafe. Um, the configuration: if you install Open Cafe into a virtual environment, uh, the configuration actually lives in the virtual environment directory. Uh, so this is the configuration where he's, we're actually running a local API on the box because remote stuff is always dangerous during a demo. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have our endpoint set, we have username, password uh, for our user, and then we have uh, well, just some other config values. A, uh, this fuzz percent, our fuzz test uh, has a linked validation. And if the link is greater than a percentage of the initial request, then it then it raises uh, a failure case. So, if it's 400 times bigger, or sorry, not 400 times, 400 percent larger than the initial request, the non-fuzzed request, it's an immediate failure. But let's go. It's, cute. it's less. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you'll see the request on the first. No, you want to see the. Uh, no, well, you have it there. It's fine. Okay, so here's our very simple payload. Um, it's just an auth request with the username and password. Uh, in this specific demo, we won't be 
doing any uh, any bugs. I had an actual OpenStack bug that we had found, but uh, that's on my laptop. Uh, so, demos. Okay. So, um, this LDAP here is one of the tests. I will so, leave that because then it's only got a couple of strings in there. Oh, okay. Versus, uh, it's a stripped down test. It only has a few strings because I don't want to show you all 15,000 requests. So, uh, so where's the pulling? Oh, uh, okay. So let's, it, it is actually comes from the Open Cafe data directory. So here we have all of our, all of our data. So it's we we consider the data separate from the config. So that is actually uh, open cafe style. You just have to be executing a single test. Yes, uh, this configuration is open cafe style. The data lives in the open cafe data directory. Uh, we're we're building off the framework. So, uh, so we, you want to show them the, the, yeah. the LDAP? LDAP. LDAP just happens to be a uh, yeah, so this is a stripped down version of the uh, FuzzDB LDAP uh, test strings. Uh, most of those in there aren't stripped down, and it's just uh, so pretty much all of the stuff from FuzzDB. So if you do the FuzzDB SQL the tests, uh, there's uh -huh. about 100 or so different strings LDAP that it'll run through there the um, in pretty much every possible field. Yep. Uh, the payloads, uh, that's a directory that he's created on the local system. The text file himself, that's uh, straight out of burp for a standard tokens request to an authentication API. Well, um, yeah, so this is a kind of a dummy API, and that's basically just the HTTP request. There's nothing special about that. Hopefully it's in the API documentation, or if you're, if you're viewing your traffic in burp, you can copy it from there. Um, so you can get it from anywhere. It's just a basic text file. There's nothing special about it. It's just a typical request with the with the method, the resource you want to hit, HTTP uh, version, the headers, and then the body. So it's it, so one thing to note is you don't have to do your individual requests one at a time, like one text file per. Yeah. It can actually do a whole folder if you just point it at a folder. Uh, there again. Yeah. The the uh, so here. Uh, these are the tests. Uh, when he when he actually does specify that LDAP on the command line, it's doing a filtering by these test names, and it's hitting, it's pulling all the tests with LDAP. Um, yeah. So these are the different LDAP tests. So there's only there's the four here. So one for the URL, one for the headers, yeah, one for the params, one for the body. Where you uh, specify the file you want to use for that test. So uh, this is why it's reading from the short file. Uh, it automatically knows to look in the Open Cafe data directory uh, because that's just how the framework works. If you want data to be brought into your test, store it, store it there, and you can access access it from anywhere when using the framework. So uh, let's let's get into the actual run. So okay, that's incredibly faster than the remote demo. Uh, so we had two failure cases. Um, Show me. We can go look at the logs, which is just a log of everything that happened in the request and the response. Um, but uh, instead, uh, we can see that these failed on the validate link, the assert true validate link call. So let's go, instead of looking at the logs, we're going to look at burp. So what we've done is we've exported uh, uh, HTTP proxy and HTTPS proxy. Uh, to allow allow us to push all of our requests through Burp, uh, and I pretty much do this on a regular basis when testing, uh, so I can monitor. And it, this works for all Python and on Linux or Mac. Uh, I don't know if that works on Windows. Anyone? Might work, but it's unsupported. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might work. Who's using Windows to test security stuff anyway? Any, anyone here? <laughs> uh, okay. It's okay. It's it's okay. We're okay with that. Yeah, uh, you know, just because you know your box may get hacked while you're checking, while you're <laughs> pen testing, you know, that's okay. Well, it helps to have those clients <laughs> too, as a as okay. an example. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, this is our initial request here. Uh, notice our so we we sent username password. We got username was not found. 
So, so then the request looks just like that original payload file. Yeah. Right. It's just a, uh, except the formatting for the JSON. So now yeah. we're going to look at our other request. So here the username has obviously been uh, fuzzed by the LDAP test string. Uh, then the password. We only have the two the two strings here, so we only see these few requests. But then we go back to another, this is another initial request because we've actually started a second test. Uh, so that was the first test that we went through was the body fuzzing. This is the initial for the header fuzzing. So now you see that uh, LDAP test string is up here. I guess pointing at my screen doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't work, right? Did y'all catch this? Just turn it around. <laughs> so I'll use the, uh, the mouse from now on. Uh, Laser and pointer. so the one that actually failed is this guy. Apparently this API, if you send in LDAP test string as a content type, it doesn't handle it well and throws a 500 exception. So uh, we automatically fail at all 500s um, because regardless if it's security or not, uh, your API shouldn't be throwing 500s. <laughs> and you can configure that per test, right? So, so if you, well, 500s are... Yeah, if you decide 500s are great, uh, <laughs> yes. Other than the purpose of this is to exploit security vulnerability, I mean, this in the end comes out of the larger context of data entry validation. Yeah. Yes. Levels, not yeah. EP request or the content. Yeah. Uh, you just write throw stuff that's quote unquote invalid info. Um, that's the current test cases that have been written. Uh, so the way we've we've written, we're going to be able to. Okay, it's good. I'm just saying the intent of hackers, they usually use those. The intent might be to find this in the world because this is an extended scope of invalid input. Yes. Yes. It sure. Definitely, it definitely handles more than just security vulnerabilities. Yeah. Uh, but the so we plan on building more than just the fuzzer into it. Like we. We eventually want to add a uh, cross uh, like resource access test that you give it a resource and it give it to users and then it'll take user one and try to access user two's resource uh, and we want we want to make that automatic as well because it's a very common uh, test case for security professionals. Uh, so you know it's it's just it's whatever whatever the security engineers build then the tool will have. Uh, the goal is to get more people. Uh, involved. I'm taking it a step further. Is that basically the biggest value, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and the automation. So it's a command line tool. So you could run it, you know, with Jenkins or yeah. whatever kind of so the goal schedule is you want. That, uh, so I think I, I consider this a problem. Currently, a lot of security professionals don't know how to do that. And I think that we're, we're quickly becoming uh, where everyone needs to know how to do that. Where yeah, where AppSec, your even your IT people are eventually going to be yeah. going to have to learn how to automate their functionality. Uh, so you know, just look at all the DevOps tools that are you know Salt Stack, uh, Ansible. Uh, these tools are going to be just like a way of life soon. Yeah, <laughs> so. um, and and additionally. Um, the thing for this tool as well is that it, it would allow you to, as the company is scaling up into that where all of your security is being turned into devs, uh, a couple devs could be developing and maintaining the code infrastructure while your base security testers can just be taking the requests and actually running all of this automation, setting up the Jenkins jobs, doing the tasks required to actually run this while you still have people doing active development to create additional test cases, start working on new APIs, anything uh, relevant to that specifically. So this, so to me as a security tester, not as a, not as somebody that actually has vision for this and where it's going, today it, it kind of mimics what Burp Intruder does, that feature, because it'll, it goes through and replaces all those parameters, all those values. Um, I'm so just showing an example log. Um, so, I'm forgetting your question initially. No, but, uh, in terms of, this is okay. Sure. So, Bert, but but when you're using Bert, right? You're sitting at your desk and you're doing it, right? And you've got all these tabs open and windows and and trying to to manage that. And for me, it it can get a you know again with all the APIs and all the resources that you're testing, that can be tough to manage. Um, 
all that data that's coming back. This can run the tests. Um, it has the validation, has a little bit, maybe a little bit more, well, it has more customizable uh, validation than what Burp has by default. Um, obviously you need to build a little bit into it for it to, to do those things, but it has that, that possibility. Like Burp, you can, it can look for specific strings in, uh, in the response and tell you and kind of flag those things. Whereas this, hopefully you can get it to a point for a specific product or a, a class of products that kind of all act the same way. You can have configurations built for those and then you can just run it all the time, right? Versus, uh, you know, saving it in Burp external to a tool something that you have to be running with your hands, this can then be, be integrated yeah. into automation. Sure. Are you guys looking at We haven't looked at it. It could be part of my build and then whatever I do, I can run. Absolutely, I, I don't. No, I mean, it's, you, you could, but we, we currently don't have that a Maven plugin for it. Uh, it recently got accepted into OpenStack, uh, and they're gonna start using it to test all of their APIs. So the dev, the dev effort uh, should be increasing massively within the next six months. Um, we hope. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's <laughs> the hope. idea, right? That's, that's the idea. Uh, so it, it will be the OpenStack uh, security framework uh, for running all of the OpenStack gates. So you have this unit test, right, and it, and it normally does a bunch of things prior to actually performing the one test. So it's got to go grab itself from identity. It's got to go create a user or create a specific resource. It has to, so they write this, this long step-by-step uh, -step test to get to the point where, okay, now yeah. I'll do my, uh, yeah, the setup. One. So, so it's, it ends up being only useful for that one QE person, that one security developer. Uh, so that unit test can only be used in that case. Uh, well, and also for it's specific to that, that API that you're testing. This is a little bit more generic where you, you, yeah, you do need specific configuration for that API, but, uh, but you don't need to build specific hooks and specific things to do what that product does. It'll go and do it for you, right? Yeah. The code's very, the code, that's built into the unit tests and the, the frameworks are specific to those products. Yeah, so normally Open Cafe, you, uh, you have to build these models and these models handle serialization and deserialization. And so just building that like, okay, I need you to test this brand new API uh, that we just spun up and you got a week to test it. Uh, we don't have any models built for it. QE hasn't even looked at it yet, but you need to make sure that it's secure. So, how, uh, so building all of that, is you know is, is basically a kind of a waste of time for security personnel. It's it's more the QE's job to build the bindings. We we only started deving on Centrogos about three months, four months ago. Yeah, and and so what we're getting from FuzzDB is just the text files of those strings that are known to create you know SQL, look for SQL injection. Look yeah, for we, we would hope that uh, LDAP injection your own personal uh, set data sets. You know, and it's a it's a good generic start. Absolutely. Yes. It, it, it is uh, built off of unit test. Um, in fact, I don't know what folder you were in before. Because I, I went to the log folder. I'm in your home now. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, just this. Oh. So, uh, you, you just you just take the test and then you have injections, right? Uh, so, uh, so uh, not not directly. So the way that the, the idea for the tool, right, is that you would take the raw uh, request from you make a request manually or something, right? So you have a working request. You take that. You save that in a text file. Beyond that, initially, you wouldn't have to do anything. You just have to run the command. Say, here's my text file that I want to go against, or here's my request. Um, and then here's the thing that I want to use, or all of them. What you, where were you? And it will where, do that the folder you're in. Uh, you don't have to use something that your QB or your devs have built. Uh, for any of the generic stuff, it's meant to work on any possible uh, XML or, J or JSON request. I mean, of that, maybe your developers are automatically generating as samples or for their dev guides or something similar like that. But then again, how 
not, uh, all, not all the time do developers keep up with dev guides. So. That's absolutely a gap. And I think that's one of the, the problems or one of the challenges with automating API testing um, for this HTTP stuff is there's no standard. There's no standard way to, to build the documents and the schemas. Everybody kind of does it differently. So if we get adoption with our developers to, to do that stuff, or documentation folks or whoever does that, or you know, somebody would need to take on kind of that, that standard. Yeah, you can just describe the page, or, or there's there's a format, right? You could export it or whatever. So again, Centrobos was accepted as an OpenStack security project. Um, and basically what that is, it's a group of, of security-minded folks that work on OpenStack. Um, they, they do a lot of good work. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a Python static analysis tool, and it's called Bandit. It's very early on, but there's a lot of changes going on there. So if you guys work with Bandit um, and you're kind of struggling like we are and trying to find something to kind of close, close some of the gaps with uh, the static analysis tools, Bandit's a good start. Um, obviously, it's open source, so if you want to contribute, all the better. Um, Anchor is a ephemeral PKI uh, solution. Um, and again, both of these, are, they're OpenStack security group projects, but they're not specific to OpenStack. You, can, you, you don't need OpenStack to run these. Um, some of the other stuff that the, the team is doing is security guides, so best practices for OpenStack deployments. Um, uh, Major Hayden from Rackspace is working on some OpenStack uh, Ansible roles so that uh, we can have some secure uh, deployments uh, built in there, and, that's, and I would imagine at some point, that's, that's really early on right now, I imagine at some point that's something that you could even use for, uh, for other, uh, other deployments as well. So we're definitely looking for helpers. I think we have something like 200 members, 200 members in OpenStack security project. Um, you know, maybe 10% of those are really active, um, but it's a, it's, a good, it's a good group of folks and it's, it's, it's security uh, based. Again, a lot of the stuff applies across the board even if you're not using OpenStack. Um, so if you find the resources helpful, let us know if, if you have any questions. Um, this is where you can find us on Freenode uh, every Thursday at 12 Central. There's an OpenStack meeting. Uh, it's about an hour. And then uh, you can reach out on the mailing list. And uh, here's the GitHub for Centrobos. Again, it's under the OpenStack uh, umbrella. Uh, so we have some documentation there as well, which might fill in some of the some of the questions that uh, that you might have after this uh, after this demo. And uh, in, anyone have any other questions? Yes, sir. So Rackspace has a pretty huge public API, right? Um, is there any information you can share on like patterns or trends and types of attacks you guys are seeing on the API? Is there something that you may want to build this tool because you're seeing those types wow. of attacks? Uh, well, <laughs> not taking care of uh, data validation. That's that's the <laughs> largest by far. Uh, especially, I mean, XML APIs, you get XXE injections. Uh, you know, they're just not validating what they're, what they're getting. Because uh, everyone uses abstractions nowadays. The, the developers aren't actually, like, looking at the, the raw data. They're, they're using some extra, uh, ex, uh, abstraction that's probably, like, an auto-generated model that's based off of like, you know, SQL Alchemy, and they're just doing transforms on these things. Uh, in fact, uh, on the demo that I have on my laptop, uh, it's, it's actually a data validation problem. Uh, with the OpenStack create user, uh, you can put in any key into the JSON. I can say, I can put a UUID and uh, put a value of 1,000 A's. And it will just take that key and store it in the database with the user, like metadata. Uh, but it's not supposed to be there. There's no, there's no point of that key. So that, that was what we found when Centurbo was fuzzing all the, the values. We're able to just create these random keys uh, because they're not validating it. They're, everything's auto-generated now. Uh, so yeah, validation becomes the largest find. It works, it works the way it is now. Um, pretty, it, it, but it's generic enough that you can just drop in that config file and, and use the tests that are built in. Um, if you want to get more in-depth testing. So we have some authentication stuff built in that supports OpenStack identity. Um, so if you're using OpenStack, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but if you need to be able to auth um, or pull in data from another source in order for these requests to actually work, which that's not the only type of testing you might want to do. You might want to try unauth testing, which is cool. Um, you might need to build custom pieces like that. 
Um, but if, if you can supply an auth token or other credentials in your config in file or in the request itself, then you can, you can go to town. It, it doesn't sound like you have to be a dev though, right, to get started. I can just copy paste and go. This is true. Awesome. This is true. And, and again, as a, as a tester myself, I want this to be something that's easy to use, right? Like, we're going into a lot of the technical details because it's a technical talk, I guess. You know, it's a tool. We want to explain how it works and what it's doing. Um, but don't let that kind of dissuade you from, from playing with it. Um, our emails were up there. So if you have questions, you need help setting something up, let us know. We're more than happy to talk about it. If you've got cap capabilities you want to be added, we can talk about that stuff too. Um, you know, we, we definitely, it's early enough, and we, and we understand that, that, but it's also a good thing that if there's more input that people want to, want to provide, like we're happy to, to take it where it needs to go. Um, like, like I said earlier, it's just filling a, potentially filling a really big gap for us, and it's, um, you know, the sky's the limit at this point. Answer your question? Cool, any other questions? Excellent, thank you so much.